Hello students, welcome to Chem 2A. This is our first lecture and we're gonna talk about classification of matter. But first we need to define chemistry. So chemistry is the field of study concerned with the characteristics, composition, and transformations of matter. And that brings us to what is matter? Well, matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. So matter can be living or non-living. It can be macroscopic, meaning big, or microscopic, meaning small. And chemistry looks at the different characteristics of these things, their compositions, and how they transform into another thing from their original state. So states of matter. Now we've got three states of matter that we can typically observe in real life and they are solid, liquid, and gas. Now solid has um, atoms or ions that are super close together. So they're packed tightly together and they don't move past each other and there's not a whole lot of room in between the little particles. Now the difference between an atom and an ion we'll talk about later. And that brings us to liquid. Now liquid, the atoms or the molecules or ions, they have a little more space between them. So you can see in the picture, we've got some space in here. And this allows the particles to move past each other. And that allows us to uh, view liquid pouring from one container to another. They can slide past each other easily. Whereas with solid, the particles were stuck right next to each other and they don't slide past each other. So you can't pour one uh, solid into another solid, uh, into another container like you can with liquid. And then with gas, what we've got is particles that are pretty far away. So they've got a lot of space or a whole lot of nothing in between them. And those particles are not very attracted to each other. So when one bumps into the other one, they just say, hi, how are you doing? And then they go on their merry way. They don't cuddle up next to each other. And solids, liquids, and gases, they have particular characteristics that we're going to talk about a little more in depth. So our solids, they have a definite shape. So if you take this cube of solid and you move it over here, it will have the exact same shape. It won't change shapes. Oop, that's a really bad drawing, but you guys get what I mean. It doesn't change its shape at all. And the solid is going to have a certain volume. So if this block of solid takes up two liters of space and we move it over here, it's still gonna have a volume of two liters. It doesn't contract to one liter or expand to three liters. It's, it stays that same volume. And because the particles are so tightly um, compacted next to each other, you can't compress solids very much. So if we take a look down here, at this piston that's trying to squish the solid in there, it really can't do it because there's not a whole lot of space in between those atoms or molecules, so there's not much give there. So we find that solids don't have much expansion or contraction. They've got a little bit of it, but not much. Now solids can also be crystalline or amorphous, and we have that example in these pictures over here. So if we take a look at the element carbon, carbon atoms, if they put themselves in exact positions, so you can see that this carbon is a certain distance from the next carbon, which is exactly the distance to that carbon, you get a specific 3D pattern and it's very regular. Whereas with our amorphous solid, we just have our carbon atoms arranged any old way 
um, that they feel like. So carbon, when it's in a solid, can have different forms. So down here, it shows us that we have carbon. And in parentheses, they put an S for solid. And over here, we can see we've got carbon. And in the parentheses, there's an S for solid. But there's different forms of solid carbon. So we uh, differentiate by putting diamond or amorphous, or we could put charcoal over there. Now, when you have a crystalline structure in your solids, that gives it a lot of strength. And we know that a diamond is really strong, whereas if you try to squish a piece of charcoal, it will squish into a different shape. So the 3D arrangement gives it a lot of strength. And then we have liquids. So liquids are different from solids because they don't have a definite shape. So if I take this liquid right here and I pour it into this big bowl here, the liquid molecules will take the shape of the bowl. So there's no definite shape for liquids, but there is a definite volume. So if this liquid in the beaker takes up two liters of space. When we put it in the bowl, it'll take up how much space? Two liters. And of course, that's in a perfect world. That means that we've got all of the liquid atoms or molecules going on over and we're not leaving any behind. And the difference between atoms and molecules will get there in this class, so don't worry about it. Just think of it as particles at this point. Now, liquids, the particles in the liquids are very close together, but they do have a little bit of space between them so they can slide past each other and move around as um, they want to. But because they're so close to each other, like solids, they also have really low compressibility, so they don't uh, expand and contract a whole lot. Again, they will a little bit, just not a whole lot. And then we have gases. So gases have no definite shape and no definite volume. So if we take the gases in the cube right here and we move them to a cylinder, the gas will take the shape of the cylinder. So there's no definite shape. Now also, Gases don't have a definite volume because the atoms or the molecules of the gases aren't attracted to each other. And so they can just fly away on their merry way how they want to. So if the cube container is three liters of space and the cylinder is four liters of space, when we move the two liters of gas into the four liter container, these gas atoms or gas molecules will move apart and expand to fill that four liter container. So then you would have four liters of gas. So that's a really interesting concept, which means that gases can expand and they can also contract so you can compress them because of all the space in between. So if we look at this piston down here, it shows us that as the piston comes down, it is compressing the gases into a smaller volume. And again, the gases can do that because originally they had a ton of space between them. So they can get really close to each other and be like, hey, let's snuggle. And the other one's like, yeah, I love snuggling. So that's what gases can do. Now let's talk about the classification of matter. So, First, we have pure substances. And the first type of pure substance I want to talk about is an element. So an element is a substance that cannot be decomposed or transformed into other chemical substances by ordinary chemical processes. So ordinary chemical processes means that like we can heat it up, or we can move it from one place to another place. It doesn't mean that we have a particle accelerator in our living room and we can bombard our elements with um, different particles and change it into something else, okay? So just ordinary stuff, not crazy stuff. 
Now, uh, atom, that's the smallest particle of an element that can exist and still have the properties of that element. Now, we tend to use the terms element and atom interchangeably, but there is a slight difference. So the element can mean just one atom of that element, or it can mean that you have a bunch of atoms of the same element. So a sheet of aluminum foil, that is the element aluminum. But if we just have one atom of aluminum, that's an aluminum atom. So slightly different definition on those, but again, we tend to use them interchangeably. Um, so under the definition of atom, the smallest particle of an element that can exist and still have the properties of that element. And that doesn't mean that the atom is the smallest thing that exists. So we have smaller things like protons, electrons, neutrons, quarks, all of those type of things. But a certain number of protons, neutrons, and electrons, when they get together to form an atom, the ratio of those different parts will give that atom a certain property. So if you have a certain number of protons, neutrons, and electrons, your atom will have the properties of aluminum. If you have different numbers of those things, you'll have different properties. So you have to have those certain ratios. Now, um, some of our elements are down here, aluminum, carbon, neon, and potassium, and we can see that they have abbreviations. And those abbreviations are called our chemical symbols or our atomic symbols. And they probably have like five different names other than what I've said, but an aluminum is a L and a carbon is a C and a neon is an NE and a potassium is a K. We can see that when we have two letters for our atomic symbol, the first is capitalized and the second is a lowercase. And if we just have one letter, it's gonna be capitalized. We can also see that for some of our elements, the atomic symbol makes sense, like carbon is C and neon is NE, and then for others, they have a kind of strange atomic symbol, like potassium is not P, potassium is K. If you wrote just P, that would mean what? Does anybody know? That's phosphorus. And here are some more of our elements on this next slide here. So mercury is our liquid metal, and that's right there. And you can see here we have one atom of mercury. And here we have the element mercury made up of a bunch of mercury atoms. And sulfur, sulfur is the next one. And we can see that it is a yellow solid at room temperature, whereas copper is a brownish orangish solid. And most of us in real life, we've seen copper before. It's kind of fun to bend it around and it's the metal that we use in wires because it conducts electricity really well. And then we have iron and on the end we have aluminum again something that we have all seen in our kitchen. At the bottom of the slides, what we have is a couple of our gases. So on the right, we have neon, and that gas we put in tubes and we run electricity through it, and that allows us to have our neon signs. And on the left-hand side, we have a greenish, yellowish, toxic gas, chlorine. And chlorines, those like to snuggle up in pairs. And so chlorines naturally occur as what's called a diatomic molecule. So they come in twos, bonded to each other. And those chlorine molecules float around in our chlorine gas. All of our elements are listed on the periodic table of elements. 
And this is something that you guys are going to use throughout the entire semester. So you should have a periodic table next to you whenever you're doing a lecture or doing your homework or doing a quiz or an exam. It usually doesn't matter which uh, periodic table you have. There's lots of them. If you do Google images, you can print those out. But what you'll see on each periodic table is a whole lot of information. And what these different pieces of information mean, we'll talk about for the rest of the semester. But for right now, I want you to familiarize yourself with how the periodic table looks and notice that you've got different elements with different symbols. So carbon is C and oxygen is O. And like we mentioned before, some of them have symbols that don't seem to make sense. But the reason for their odd symbol uh, is a little bit of history. And we'll talk about that soon. So potassium is symbol K. Tungsten is W, which seems really strange. Like, where did we get that one? And then also notice that there's a few others that seem like we could get them mixed up really easily. For instance, copper is CU, whereas cobalt is CO. So copper is not CO, that's cobalt. Also, magnesium is MG, whereas manganese is MN. So make sure you're familiarizing yourself with the periodic table right away because it'll just make your life easier. Okay, so we've done elements and that's one of our pure substances. And another pure substance that we have is a compound. Now a compound is a substance that consists of two or more different atoms or atoms of different elements chemically bonded in a fixed ratio. And we have two types. We have ionic compounds and covalent compounds. And covalent compounds and ionic compounds, the differences between those and how we name them and how we figure out their formulas, we'll spend all of chapter three and chapter four talking about that. So, the first one that we see here is sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is made up of the elements sodium and chlorine. And they are in the lowest ratio of one to one. So how you could also write sodium chloride is with a one down here and a one down there. But the thing about the ones is a lot of times we don't see the number one, and that's something you'll see throughout the semester also. So if you don't see a number, you can assume it's one. If the number is anything other than one, you have to write the number, like with CO2. So there's a one down there by the C, and there is a two by the O. But anyways, back to sodium chloride. What we have for sodium chloride is we have a sodium sitting next to a chlorine. And these actually turn into charged particles when they go into a compound. But that's the subject of chapter 3, so don't worry about it now. And because they're charged, what they do is they attract other sodiums and chlorines or when it has a minus one charge on it the chlorine goes to chloride but the lowest ratio of sodium to chloride is one to one even though it builds up into this nice big crystal and we crush the crystal and we put it all over our food and it makes everything taste better and that is regular old table salt so there are other salts in chemistry but the salt that is most important to us and is most common in real life is sodium chloride, regular old salt, okay? Now, uh, the covalent compound carbon dioxide. This is made of one carbon and two oxygens. And it's definitely in a fixed ratio of one carbon to two oxygens. If we change the ratio, if we made it one to one, 
that would no longer be carbon dioxide. That would be what? Does anybody know? That would be carbon monoxide. And carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide are completely different compounds. So we want to make sure we've got the subscript numbers correct or we're saying it's a different compound. But if you only have one of your compounds in a big bowl of your compound, then you have a pure substance. Now that brings us to mixtures. These are no longer pure substances. Mixtures are combinations of two or more pure substances and each of the substances is going to retain its own identity. So it's going to retain its own chemical and physical properties. So the first type of mixture we're going to talk about is a heterogeneous mixture. So this is a substance in which the elements and or compounds, so we can go elements or compounds that we're mixing up, are blended together in such a way that there is no uniform composition or fixed ratio of the components of the mixture. So that was a lot of blah, 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 blah. So let's look at the pictures and it'll become a whole lot more clear. So let's look at a mixture of oil and water. So we have oil and water here, and these two substances are going to retain their own composition. So if we took a sample from here and a sample from here, we would find that the two different substances had their own physical and chemical characteristics, their own melting points, boiling points, electrical conductivity, density, uh, viscosity, flammability, all of those things. What we can also see that will tell us that something is a heterogeneous mixture is something called an interface. That is the boundary between one substance and another substance. And the interface in the first picture is right here. We can see with our eyeballs where one substance ends and another substance begins. The same thing with our mixed nuts. So our mixed nuts down here, that's a heterogeneous mixture. We can see where the pecan ends and the pistachio begins and where the pistachio ends and the almond begins. And if we took a sample from each of the nuts, we would find that they had different physical and chemical characteristics. Each one of them would have different compositions of fats, proteins, carbohydrates, salts, all of that stuff. And that brings us to the second type of mixture called a homogeneous mixture. So a homogeneous mixture is a substance in which the different elements or compounds that are being mixed exist in definite ratios but are not chemically bonded. So we have two or more substances that we're mixing together and no amount of magnification is going to reveal an interface. So if we look at a homogeneous mixture with our eyeballs or with a microscope, we cannot see where one substance ends and the other one begins. So an example is right here at the top where we have sugar and in the glass we have water. So we have two substances, sugar and water, and we put the sugar into the water and it dissolves. Now the sugar stays sugar and the water stays water, H2O, but they're mixed together, but we cannot see where the sugar molecule ends and the water molecules begin. We don't see an interface in this mixture. Also, if we took a sample from here and a sample from here, we would find that this substance, this mixture, has the same physical and chemical properties. So it, those two different samples would have the same melting point, boiling point, electrical conductivity, density, flammability, etc., etc. Now, homogeneous mixtures, we tend to call these solutions. And we have an entire chapter dedicated to solutions. So we'll talk a whole lot about solutions through this entire course. 
So some examples of homogeneous mixtures, we've got salt water where we pour salt into water and it dissolves, sugar water, which we just did up here, or we can have a gas dissolved in a liquid like oxygen dissolved in water. And what I'm talking about is say you have a tank full of water, which is a liquid, and you have the gas oxygen and oxygen that we breathe is two oxygen atoms bonded together so it's an O2 so we have oxygen molecules so two oxygen atoms bonded together it's called an oxygen molecule these oxygen molecules are floating around in the water and we cannot see where the oxygen molecule ends and the water molecules begin. So there's no interface. And if we took a sample from here and a sample from here, we would find that they have the same physical and chemical characteristics. Now this is not the same thing as if we had bubbles of oxygen. So if we have bubbles of oxygen, a bunch of oxygen molecules making up a bubble, like we might see in a fish tank, is that still homogeneous? No, that would be heterogeneous. We can see where the water ends and the oxygen begins with our eyeballs. We can see that boundary. The um, border is the bubble. And so if we took a sample out here and a sample in here, we would find that those two samples had very different physical and chemical properties. Another example we can see down here is the sugar water example again. It just shows it to you on a molecular level where you have one substance and another substance and you put them together to make a mixture. And each of the mixtures retains its molecular integrity. So the sugar molecules are still sugar molecules. They're just distributed within the water and the water is still H2O, but we can't see where the sugar molecule ends and the water molecules begin. There's no interface. So that would be a homogeneous or homogeneous mixture. Now, if you tuned me out and you were thinking about your date on Friday night, that's okay because I have a whole diagram for you. So we have the catch-all category matter, and on the left-hand side, we have pure substances, and on the right-hand side, we have mixtures. So we can see pure substances are broken into elements and compounds. And the elements, that's going to be just one kind of atom, just one element. And so if you had a tank full of helium, all you would have are helium atoms floating around. That's a pure substance, that's pure helium. And another kind of pure substance is our compound. So remember, that is a substance that's composed of different types of atoms or different elements in a fixed ratio. So water is always H2O, or if we wanted to draw it out, we could draw it like that. We cannot change that ratio because if we changed it to H2O2, that would not be water any longer. That would be hydrogen peroxide, so fixed ratio. So right here, we have a pure compound. We have a bottle or a container of pure water. Now on the other side, we have mixtures, and mixtures can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. Now looking down here at our water sand mixture, we can definitely see the interface. With our eyeballs, we can see the boundary between sand and water, where the sand ends and the water begins. If there's grains of sand up here, we can see where the grain of sand ends and the water begins. So interface, and if we took a sample from down here and a sample from up there, we would find that we'd have different chemical and physical properties. Now, homogeneous mixture. 
you got a mixture of different substances, but you don't see any interface. And if you took a sample from here and a sample from here, you'd have the same physical and chemical properties. So our T is going to be a mixture of water and caffeine because who wants tea with no caffeine? Not me! And maybe sugar. I don't like sugar in my tea, but I know most people do. And tannins. Tannins are the things that give the tea that brown color. But we can't see where the caffeine molecule ends and the water molecule begins, or where the sugar molecule ends and the water molecules begin. So this is a homogeneous mixture. Now, if we dumped so much sugar into the tea that the water in the tea couldn't dissolve as much sugar as we had in there, we'd get a buildup of sugar on the bottom of the teacup, and would that still be a homogeneous mixture? No, that would change it to heterogeneous because we could see the definite boundary between the sugar layer and the tea. So, we got to be careful with these things. All right, let's do some problems. So, we're going to decide whether our mixtures are heterogeneous or homogeneous. So, number one says chocolate chip cookie dough. Can we definitely see with our eyeballs where the chocolate chip ends and the dough begins? Yes, and they definitely have different properties because if you eat chocolate and then you eat the dough by itself, your tongue can tell. Okay, let's taste different. There's different properties here. So this one is what? This one is heterogeneous. What about wine? So we've got a glass of wine and we have water and ethanol and sugar molecules. Yep, we got a little bit of that in our wine and we have ethanol molecules, so that's our drinking alcohol. But can we see where the ethanol molecule ends and the water molecules begin? Is there a boundary there? Nope, it's all one phase, one solution. And if you took a sample from here, in a sample from here, you'd find that you had the same physical and chemical characteristics. So wine is homogeneous. What about milk? Now milk is the example that every chemistry book, every te chemistry textbook has in it as a problem. And it's one of those ones they use to trick you. Now most of us would say, okay, milk says homogenized on the outside, so it must be homogeneous. But the thing is that it's actually heterogeneous. And the reason is because when you put it on a microscope slide, what you will see is the water layer and then you will see fat globules in there. So the aqueous phase or the water part of it contains water molecules and milk protein, which is casein and milk sugar, which is lactose but also the fat globules that you can see. So you can see the boundary between the aqueous and the fatty layers. And when we milk a cow or a goat or a sheep, whatever we're milking, and we let it sit for a while, what we'll have is we'll have a fat layer on top and we'll have the aqueous or milk layer on the bottom. And the farmer will take the top layer off the fat layer to make butter and cream and leave the watery layer below. But there's still fat in that milk. So what they do is they send it to the milk processing uh, place and then they spin it at high speed. And they also heat it up to pasteurize it to kill any of the germs in there. But the spinning and the heating will make the fat globules so small that with a naked eye, we're not seeing that, okay? But if you put it on the microscope, you will be able to see it. So milk is actually heterogeneous, but we homogenize it so it looks homogeneous. And then we have the example of O2 and water, and we've already done that one on a previous slide. That one is homogeneous. And if I said oxygen bubbles in water, how would that change the answer? 
that would be heterogeneous, yes, because you could see where the water ends and the gas begins there, where the liquid ends and the gas begins. What about chicken noodle soup? We definitely can see the different parts of the mixture there. We can see where the noodle ends and the soup part, the broth part begins, and we can see the carrots and the celery floating in there, and it's all separate. And they all have different physical and chemical properties. So this one is definitely hetero. What about Kool-Aid? Can you see where the sugar molecule ends and the water molecules begin? You dump a packet of Kool-Aid in there and you're putting some acid molecules and you're putting dye molecules in there. Can you see the dye molecule floating around? Be like, oh, there's the dye molecule. No, so this one is homogeneous. Now, if we have a pitcher of this stuff and you put a ton of sugar in there, like most of us do when we're kids, because we're like, we want it really, 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 really sweet, and we stir it up, and we hope that all the sugar will stay dissolved in the water, but the water can't take on that much sugar, and the sugar settles out to the bottom, then that switches it to what kind of mixture? then that would be hetero. We could see the boundary between the sugar layer and the aqueous layer there, up there. Okay, so that brings us to physical properties, and I'm going to stop the video here so it's easier for me to upload and continue on with physical and chemical properties and changes in the next video. So I will see you soon. Bye-bye.